In this video, I'm showing you the very simple tech stack that allowed me to build this startup that has now made more than $100,000 in less than six months. Most people think that making a monetizable startup has to be super complicated and you need to spend years learning all these different technologies and these super complicated topics. But in actuality, if you just learn the right tools and you understand them enough to combine them together, you can actually get to the point with your development skills that you can build Build a real world monetizable piece of software much quicker than you ever imagined. So in this video, I'm showing you all the tools, technologies, programming languages, and everything in between that I have used to build this startup. And I hope that this video can serve as kind of a guide to give you an idea of what are all the different tools and technologies and frameworks and everything that you will have to learn if you want to build a real functioning piece of software and also how to combine them together into a real software that real people can use. And you will also learn how to accept money for it and everything. And it's actually much, much easier than you realize once you just know what tools to use. But first, what is this startup? What is the app? What is an app called RefTrack? It's essentially a tracking software aimed at YouTubers and content creators like myself. So for example, you might be aware that I sell some products on this channel, like my Python developer bootcamp or my Algo University course. Essentially what this software that I created allows me to do is to track which videos generate the most clicks and the most sales. And it gives me access to this kind of dashboard where I can see like, okay, this video generated this many clicks, this many sales, this much revenue, etc. I can look at analytics and all this kind of stuff. So this is essentially what the software does. So before we get into the technical tools and frameworks, let's just start with the hardware that I use to code the startup. The computer that all of this has been built on is this one. This is the 16 inch M1 MacBook Pro bought all the way back in 2020. Two funny story. Actually, I bought this laptop with the very first 4,000 euros that I made from this particular YouTube channel that you're watching right now. It was pretty much the biggest moment of my life, actually making money from my own business. And immediately I wanted to use it on a really powerful laptop. And ever since this has essentially been the powerhouse of all of my coding work, as well as my YouTube work on this channel and my other YouTube channels as well. If you're a programmer, you don't even need anything as powerful as this, like a simple MacBook Air, like the cheapest model is absolutely enough for coding work. So for people out there who are worrying about, oh, is my laptop good enough? Is my, com is my computer good enough? It pretty much any laptop is good enough for coding work these days. Now getting into the AI tools that I use to code. So in 2025, if you're not using AI to write most of your code, you're really falling behind. And a lot of developers are afraid of AI, but actually I think AI is pretty much the best thing that has happened for us developers, especially the kind of developers who want to build our own applications. Like just because of AI, I've been able to get this app to this point where it's pretty much done and it's making a bunch of money in a couple of months when it might have taken me like years to do that before the age of AI. In terms of which LLMs I use, I keep switching it all the time. And what's also great for us developers is that there's constantly new AI tools coming out. There's so many different companies creating new AI coding tools, like really to make development as fast as possible for developers. So I essentially just keep trying all of them and I keep changing them a lot of the time. I started out using the basic ChatGPT until I found out that there are AI code editors like Cursor, where you can just literally have the code editor window inside of the IDE. And then at one point I switched from Cursor back to VS Code code using an AI coding extension called Augment Code. That's what I've used for the longest time. But ever since, again, I've been switching. I've been using tools like Warp or Cogent. They're more like agentic coding platforms where you can let these AI agents run in the background. There's some very interesting stuff you can do with them. So it really, really depends. But really what I want you to understand is that the AI tool that you use really doesn't matter. What matters is how effectively you prompt the AI. The simple truth is that detailed prompts equal better results. But typing detailed prompts is very slow. And honestly, most of us developers are too lazy to do it. That is why no matter which AI tool I happen to be using, I use it with a tool called Whisper Flow. Whisper Flow is an AI powered dictation tool that works inside any app 
you type in with no additional setup. The way it works is that you simply install it, you set a hotkey, and you can essentially just speak directly into any app you're using. Let me show you an example to give you an idea. So I've got cursor open over here, and when I press this hotkey over here, I can start talking to Whisper. So I'm gonna press the hotkey, create a new endpoint in the file server.js, and it's going to paste that into my chat window directly. And it's even tagged the file because Whisper can actually recognize files. So let me now show you a comparison of speaking versus typing a long prompt. So let's try to type this prompt first. Create a new endpoint that fetches users from the database, including images, versus with Whisper, what I can just do is this. Create a new endpoint that fetches users from the database, including images. And that was clearly like four times quicker. It also understands variable naming. If I tell it to create a variable called clerk user ID, it knows how to use camel case and all these kind of variable naming patterns. And inside of the Flow app itself, you can create snippets. For example, here I have API endpoint, which equals to this code snippet. So rather than having to type that in, I can just talk API endpoint and it's gonna put that into the file from my snippets. The best part about Flow is that it works in any app where you type, including on Mac, Windows, and even iPhone. And all my snippets, custom dictionary, everything like that syncs across all my devices. And ever since I started using Flow, I honestly cannot live without it. Now they are sponsoring this video, but I genuinely use Flow daily. Check them out from the link down below in the description to get started. Now going into the actual coding tool. So this is a full stack web app with a front end, a back end, a database, hosting and a Chrome extension, which is kind of just specific to this application. So starting out with the programming languages, we have JavaScript, which is actually what this entire application is built in, both the front end and the back end. And even though I used to be more of a Python developer, I've ended up pretty much becoming a JavaScript developer, just for the simple fact that with JavaScript, you can build the front end and the back end using the same programming language. So I don't have to context switch between different languages. Not that that would be a big problem, but it's just a small problem that I can only think about mastering one language because of the framework Node.js and things like Express in the back end, you can use JavaScript to also write your servers on top of your front end, which just makes it more efficient for me. Then I obviously use HTML and CSS to write a lot of my front end, obviously, just like every other front end. And I use SQL to write my database queries. And there's ways, obviously, that you don't have to write raw SQL, you can use these object relational models and things like that. But I actually just write raw SQL inside of my code because for whatever reason, that was just easier for me and I've just kind of stuck to that. Now going into the front end frameworks and libraries. So my entire front end and pretty much all the front ends I've built in my entire life are in React. A lot of people are saying, oh, React is outdated. You should use Next.js and there's all these like new cool frameworks. They might be better. Like it, I'm not saying React is the best. It's just the one that I know, the one that I learned way back when, when I first learned front-end development and I've just stuck to it because I know React and there's no real advantage for me to learn a new framework for like slight efficiency or whatever. I just rather stick to what I know. Instead of React, I use React Router DOM for client-side routing. So essentially when you click on different links inside of the application, that uses the React Router DOM to just open different links within React. I found that to be more efficient than like actually rerouting to a different URL or something like that by a server-side rendering or something like that, although obviously there's pros and cons to each of those approaches. I use a package called ReCharts for data visualization. So if you're wondering how I did all these graphs and things like that, it's just a package that I use. I haven't actually gone and coded up a custom chart or anything like that. I just found a library that does it. And again, I don't know if this is the best one. It's just pretty much the first one I found and it seemed to work. So that is what I have stuck with. So obviously the front end has to make constant API requests to my server. And for that, I use a tool called Axios. It's pretty much, I think it's the most popular way to make API requests from the front end to your backend server so or to any external APIs if you need to be doing that. Now moving on to the backend. So like I already mentioned, I have written my backend in JavaScript using the Node.js server runtime environment. And within Node.js, I use Express.js as the web 
framework to actually build my application. A lot of people these days, they use Next.js or whatever. And again, it might be better, it might be worse. I don't really know. It's just way back when, when I first learned how to write backend using Node.js and people are saying, oh, what about Django? What about all this? Like all of those work. Don't worry about which one you use. Just pick pretty much the one that you know the best and use that and don't think too much about it. So these are the basics of the front end and the back end. Now when it comes to authentication and authorization, so this is essentially handling all the login and sign up flows inside of my application. I use a user authentication and management system called Clerk, which I was recommended to you by a friend. It's much better than the ones I've used previously. Uh, the UI is good. It's easy to set up. They have pre-built components for React and everything like that. It's worked really, really well for me. Now moving on to database and storage. As the language, I use Postgres SQL and my database is connected to Versal where my application is hosted more of them in a second. And inside of Versal, there is a way to essentially connect directly into a PostgreSQL database using a service called Neon. And just because it was the easiest solution, that is what I have stuck with. Now, a very, very important part, payment processing. I use Stripe exclusively. Before Stripe existed, it was very, very difficult for anyone to create a startup and actually take payments because the actual process of taking in credit card payments is very, very complicated. You need to like, Actually, I don't even know like all the stuff that happens behind the scenes, but because of a service called Stripe, and now there's other ones out there, of course, as well, you essentially don't need to understand anything about how to take credit cards and like security and all this stuff. You can just plug in Stripe. They have very good API documentation, very, very easy to connect to your server, and you can now take payments as long as you are able to create a Stripe account pretty much, which pretty much anyone can do. Really, really fantastic service. This is what we use to manage all our payments, all our subscriptions. And essentially whenever a user logs in, which is check, check from Stripe, is this user still an active subscriber? And anytime their subscription renews, he auto charges them and everything like that. Really, really good service. Again, just allows me to focus on creating the application rather than all this complicated logic when it comes to payments. And pretty much any good startup is kind of a wrapper around a lot of other external services. And this app is no exception. We use a lot of external services to make our app better. We use Google APIs to allow the users to connect their YouTube account to our application. And inside of the application, we have an AI chatbot which we have built using the OpenAI API. We use the Mailgun API, which is a previous sponsor of this channel actually, to send emails to users in certain cases. We use a service called Mixpanel to get analytics about how our users use our application so we can make it better. And we also use a tool called Posthog to get this kind of heat map on where people are clicking on the application to like understand like what part of the app do people use the most and things like that. Then for deployment and infrastructure, I use Vercel. I know Vercel can be like controversial for some people and like I just don't like to get into any of that. It works for me. It's very, very easy to set up applications there. And now that I know it again, I've just kind of stuck to it. So Vercel works as what's called like pay by use. So essentially they charge you based on the traffic that is sent to the server and they handle all of the hosting and everything behind the scenes and there are some cases where if you're not careful with it, it can charge you a lot of money if you have a ton of usage, but we charge enough money for all our customers that even though we have a lot of traffic going in, the bills for our, for our servers go nowhere near even being significant. So I haven't seen any reason to use anything else. And then I use a thing called CDN, specifically in Amazon CloudFront, to host a lot of scripts that our users install on their websites that allow RevTrack to track clicks and sales and things like that. And then some ancillary tools that are not technically coding related. I use Notion to take notes and we have a Notion workspace with my co-founder where we like list our priorities. We don't actually use that that often these days, but we do have that. I use a to-do app called Todoist to manage my tasks where that has a list of like, okay, what am I supposed to do and things like that. And then we use WhatsApp for communication with my co-founder. So as a conclusion, the big point here is that the stack that you use really doesn't matter. Again, as long as you have something for the front end, something for the back end, something for hosting, something for a database, if you do need a database, pretty much anything works. And then it's just about 
learning how to use different APIs, looking at different documentation, just having the right attitude that if I don't know something, I can figure it out. Just like going straight into the deep end, kind of like gluing stuff together in a way that makes sense for the particular application that you want to use. As long as you do that, anything is going to work. The main point is knowing how to create a software that solves a problem for someone. No one cares about your tech stack, but I hope that this can give you some kind of an idea of what are all the tools required to build something like that. And also make sure to check out Flow down below in the description. A must have for pretty much any developer. And with that, I will see you in the next video.